shall you fear? I pray as you open to speak today that there would be pure joy in your words. Pure God. I thank you for Shirley. I thank you that she is so... What's the word? Obedient to you, Father. Obedient. And so I just ask you to give her all she needs now as she prepares to give us what it is you're trying to say to us and open our ears so that we will hear every single word. Amen. Thank you. Yes, Lord, we thank you so much for Shirley. We thank you for all the careful preparation she's made. But most of all, Lord, we thank you for the message she's going to bring from you that you will have not just a main message, but something for everyone in here, that a word that they really need to listen to. And we thank you, Lord, that Shirley is so in tune with you that she can speak your words uh, clearly and loudly and well. Thank you, Lord. My apologies. There's always one, isn't there? <laughs> okay. So, for instance, when we have visitors, and I, many of you aren't aware that, of what happens here during the week. You have no idea how busy it is. For various reasons, you know, you're working, you're doing these different things, and there are so many people in this place during the week. And often... The office is totally full of people. And then we get a visitor who wants to speak to Michael. And it's mayhem. So that room will be lovely for Michael to, or me, or Keith, or whoever the person has come to visit, to just go into a quiet room and just have peace and order. It'll be really nice. Not Also, we do a lot of prayer ministry. We've been freezing in the porter cabin, as the children do, you know, having ministry in the porter cabin is not fun on days like this. So it's going to be lovely. We're going to have that extra room. And uh, prayer meetings, the prayer meetings that happen here, we can have them in a small heated room instead of, you know, in the cold unit six. I think, well, I think we should call unit six the hub. What do you think? The hub? Because unit six is a bit sort of nothing, isn't it? Why don't we call it the hub? Pastor? Okay, it's agreed. Okay. So instead of sitting in the cold in the hub, we can go into the, the uh, small room, which we still have to name. Okay. We have had an amazing time uh, over this last year when God has really blessed us. This is Father's house, and God is in the house. Amen. Um, but I want to encourage you that uh, uh, we still have a long way to go. <laughs> and that, that room next door is just the first of three, three, four rooms altogether, plus then more toilets and a, and a kitchen that we want to build. And so I want to encourage you to come to the Curry Cabaret on the 7th. 
okay? Um, would you come? Would you come and just have fellowship with us and would you enjoy uh, either curry, if you like curry, or a non-curry meal? There will be a non-curry meal for those of you who have not quite reached the heights <laughs> of spectacular food that curry is, okay? And they'll be vegetarian. We encourage you to come. Uh, we want to, we want to um, move forward and we're now at a stage where we've, we've spent all the money. So we don't like to ask for money, but we want to give you something in exchange. So would you come on the 7th and uh, bring a song or a poem or a sketch or do something that will entertain us? We like homegrown entertainment. So we look forward to everybody bringing something. That'll be a really good time. And don't forget to bring cash or your checkbook. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Okay. Every day of the week, there's something going on here. Tomorrow, there will be, I'm not sure whether it's Hebrew classes or Israeli dancing, but uh, on top of that, there is uh, an exhibition. This, the phot photographic exhibition, which has been up here since we moved in here, is uh, being viewed by the uh, Liverpool Jewish community tomorrow. And praise God for that. Isn't that lovely? Um, Grace is here, and uh, she'll be here to take them through the, uh, all, the, all the, the meanings behind the, the photographs, the reason why they were taken. Um, and Sam cleans on a Sunday as well, so m Sunday doesn't just stop. <coughs> and then Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, there's a prayer meeting. Many of you have not made it to a prayer meeting yet, and, and although it was a year ago that I stood and I spoke and I said how important it is for us to pray. You know, prayer is the engine room of a church. And didn't Yeshua ask his disciples to pray? You know, tarry with me an hour, just one hour. And, um, and I personally have been so blessed by these prayer meetings. We pray according to what the Holy Spirit uh, reveals to us, unless there's something specific, and it's a real blessing. And I just want to, again, urge everybody, can you make one prayer meeting a week? Could you come? Could you pray? Because the more of us, the better. And I know that everybody has um, uh, difficulties and, and, and things to deal with, but I just want to, I really want more people to come and pray. It's so important. Uh, Derek Prince says that God does everything through prayer, and he does nothing without it. And I can see answers to those prayers that we've been praying this year. We're in our, this week will be our 40th week of prayer. Six days a week of prayer. And it's important. I want to encourage you to come. We have the well meeting on a Tuesday. We have Bible discussion and fellowship. We have uh, various ministries. Has anybody noticed that more recently we've got the most beautiful flower decorations in our church? <laughs> For me, they are a personal joy. I absolutely love seeing fresh flowers. And uh, Elaine Finn is running the, this, this ministry. And she's willing to teach anybody who would like to learn. Ellie's now learning, and uh, previous, the, the previous couple of weeks to, to these two, she had produced one of those beautiful decorations, the yellow one, and it was as professional as anybody's. So anybody can do it. So if you want to just speak to Elaine and get involved, she would love to have more people than she can cope with to teach to, to do uh, floral arranging. Overhead projection, we need more people on that. We need more people to volunteer to put those words up because it's part of the ministry of this church. It's part of the service, like the sound desk is. You know, that's probably a little more difficult to get a handle on. But, you know, these are ministries that's, that serve God, that we give of ourselves to God in. And the more people we have on the rota and making tea, Serving coffees and teas, washing up afterwards. The more people we have on the rotors, the less we have to do it. The less it falls down to just the two or three people. 
So I want to encourage us. I want to, I want to spur us on to get the vision to serve God again. You know, it's this time of year, it always goes, ugh. It's always, you know, it's dark, isn't it? I mean, it's dark now, at 10 past five. And it's cold and people don't want to come out. And there's always a reason why we shouldn't leave home. And, and Michael and I are the same. We don't want to, you know, there's many times when we don't want to do what we have to do, but we do it. We do it because our heart is primarily to do what God has called us to do, to follow him. And I want to I just goad people to doing more, ask people to do more. So there's just one last thing that as we have been here, one of the prayers that we've been praying is that we would be a light in this area. You know, God has, has um, planted us here in the middle of Shotton, Deeside, and we've been saying, Lord, would you use us? We want to be a light, and, and we've asked him to open doors so that, so that we can um, be useful to him, that we can produce something of the kingdom for those who are not in the kingdom. And this has been really difficult. You know, very many reasons why. But we've begun to see that God is showing us what the need is. And you know that there are lots of people who are hungry here. We, um, for Tabernacles this year, we had our booth, remember? Most of us bought, um, brought in some foodstuffs, various stuff. And um, the collection was made, and we were able to give some food to growing places next door. Now, those of you who don't come during the week, this place next door looks after special needs men, grown men, and gives them jobs to do, um, gardening and digging and planting and sowing and you know, harvesting, and, and, and they used to come on, on mass in a, in a van to Marleyfield. When I, I used to bump into them when I went to see my mum. And uh, they also open up their doors, and they have a wood-turning class on a Monday evening. And some people who come to that wood-turning class are hungry. Some people who come through the doors are hungry because they haven't got enough money to buy food. Michael went across to Red Bill. We've got relationship. We've built relationship over the years with all our neighbors. And Red Bill, the, my, the man there, what's his name, Michael? Uh, Gary. He said, um, do you do meals over at your place? He said, I've, I've got this friend who's he's got 160 pounds a month to live on. And you know what? That's not a lot. I can spend that in a week. Most of us can with families to feed and so on. It's a not a lot of money. And he's hungry. And, and he, Gary knows that he's hungry and that he hasn't got enough food. So one of the things that we're doing from now on, if you go to the kitchen, you'll see a black bin. Bring, go to your pantry and see what you've got left over. Bring what you've got, and we're going to start giving it out. Maybe, maybe somebody has got a, a vision for doing a... A cafe, not a, not a full-on cafe, but just doing a lunch once a week. Maybe on a Thursday when we're closed, when we're, we're, we're busy, when we have our day off. I'm, I'm saying that because we're up to here. We need, we need the body to get the vision to do the things that we can't do. Maybe somebody would like to make soup and, and, and a sandwich, a soup kitchen. And that we might just begin to get a trickle of people who are hungry for physical bread, who might then understand that there is spiritual bread to be had. Amen. Matthew 4. Very simple word this week. Really, it's about the call of God on our lives. The call of God is the same for each one of us. And it's the same now as it was 2,000 years ago. Matthew 4, starting at verse 18. 
As Yeshua was walking beside the Sea of Galilee, he saw two brothers, Simon called Peter and his brother Andrew. They were casting a net into the lake, for they were fishermen. Come, follow me, Yeshua said, and I will send you out to fish for people. At once they left their nets and followed him. Going on from there, he saw two other brothers, James, son of Zebedee, and his brother John. And they were in a boat with their father Zebedee, preparing their nets, and Yeshua called to them. And immediately they left the boat and their father, and they followed him. Simple as that. Please don't leave. Don't worry about it at all. It's no problem. We're used to it. Really simple. Come, follow me. Yeshua has just recently returned from the wilderness, hasn't he? He spent 40 days and 40 nights in the wilderness. He goes to Capernaum, and there on the shores of the lake, he sees men, ordinary men working, Ordinary men doing what they do, being fishermen, casting their nets into the water, a simple trade, no education, no skills really apart from that which is passed down from generation to generation, no A-levels, no university degree required to be a fisherman, at least there wasn't when I was growing up. Everything requires an A-level or a, a degree now, doesn't it? But I, I think probably fishermen are still safe. Fishermen work with their hands. They're not even skilled such as a carpenter or a, a wood turner next door. And they're dependent on their intuition and their knowledge of the natural things to know where the fish are at any one time, to be able to go and cast their nets and to draw in the haul. We're not sure, we don't know, because the scripture doesn't make it clear, but they were probably married. Maybe one or two of them were single, I, we don't know. But they probably had families. And yet, this scripture, one of the most profound scriptures that we can read, is that Yeshua simply said to them, come, follow me. <laughs> and they did. And they did. Would you now, here now? Would I? I can't imagine what it, I, I can imagine, but I can't get a hold on what it was that Yeshua demonstrated, that Yeshua was, that, that Yeshua had that was so magnetic to make those men leave their livelihood just on three words and to up sticks and follow him. Matthew 9, verse 9. As Yeshua went on from there, he saw a man named Matthew sitting at the tax collector's booth. Follow me, he told him. And Matthew got up and followed him. Again. Simple as that. Now, Matthew, we understand to be an ordinary man. He was named a sinner by the Jews, but he was doing a job for the Romans. He'd probably been forced into it. It wasn't his choice, but he was forced into it probably because he did have some skills or he did have um, a, a level of an intelligence that was regarded as being one who was able to do all the calculations necessary to be a tax collector but it wasn't really much of a job in everybody else's eyes. Hated. Probably better paid than a fisherman as well. Probably better paid, but he heard the call, didn't he? And so it didn't matter. When it comes to his response, he's the same. It's just on the same level. Come, follow me. And he did. So the call went out to rich and poor alike. No respecter of persons is our God. 
And we remember in Luke 18, 22, that a rich young man responded, didn't he? And the rich young man came to him and asked him questions, and he said, what must I do to inherit the kingdom of heaven? And Yeshua says to him in Luke 18, verse 22, when he heard him, he said to him, you still lack one thing. Sell everything you have and give to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. Then, come, follow me. Luke 18, 28, Peter said to him, we've left all we had to follow you. And John 1, the first chapter of John, John 1 recounts how Yeshua found Philip an instant believer. He, as he was going around, he found him, he was an instant believer. And then he found Nathaniel, a skeptic. Does anything good come out of there? I don't think so. And what did Yeshua say? Regardless. He didn't say, you've got to believe in me before you can follow me. You've got to have some understanding of who I am before you follow me. You've got to have a bit of money in the bank to prepare for me and to be able to look after me before you follow me. Not at all. Follow me. I can remember where I was when I heard those words, follow me. Can you? They may not have been exactly that, but they were as good as that. And most of us are neither fishermen nor tax collectors. Most of us are neither wealthy nor poor. But the call is the same, whatever our circumstances, whatever our position in life. As I said, God is no respecter of persons. And I don't believe anything has changed as we've come down the centuries. God has not changed his ways, has he? He's the same yesterday, today, and forever, and we can rely on that. His commands are the same. His call remains the same. Echoing through the ages, come, follow me. Follow Yeshua. Be a disciple. Be a believer. But what does it mean? In this day and age, being a Christian, being a believer, I prefer the word believer because Christian means so many things nowadays. Being a believer, what does it mean? I came across a poem in, in the UCB magazine. And it says it really so well. Some of you may have read this. When I say that I am a believer, I am not shouting that I'm clean living. I'm whispering, I was lost, but now I'm found and forgiven. When I say that I am a believer, I don't speak of this with pride. I'm confessing that I stumble and need him to be my guide. When I say that I am a believer, I'm not trying to be strong. I'm professing that I am weak and need his strength to carry on. When I say that I'm a believer, I'm not bragging of success. I'm admitting I have failed and need God to clean my mess. When I say that I'm a believer, I'm not claiming to be perfect. My flaws are far too visible, but God believes I'm worth it. When I say that I'm a believer, I still feel the sting of pain. I have my share of heartaches, so I call upon his name. When I say that I'm a believer, I'm not holier than thou. I'm just a simple sinner who received God's good grace somehow. Our transformation from unbeliever to believer renders us all unqualified. And I will unpack that a bit more. Unqualified to take credit for anything that God has either given us or enabled us to do. And that includes everything, actually. 
And whatever job those men whom Yeshua called to follow him back in those days when he walked the earth, whatever they were doing at the time, whatever position they held or not, they were all individuals, just like you and me, unique personalities with their own individual temperament. Describes us all, doesn't it, really? We're all unique individuals with our own unique personality or temperament. We're all different. It's the amazing thing about God, how he's made us all so unique and yet so unified in his spirit and through him. Hallelujah. And we've all said yes. I don't think there's anybody here who hasn't said yes. I will follow you. But the thing is that the journey that Yeshua brings us, what he presents to us, where he takes us, is costly and it's challenging, it's painful, and in the main, it's hard. <laughs> and many turn back in greater or lesser degrees from the fullness of his call on our lives. What is the fullness of his call? Well, Oswald Chamber, one of my favorites, and there I think there are a couple of his daily reading books available in the left in the, uh, on the bookshelf uh, in the shop of his daily readings, which are transforming. If you've never heard of Oswald Chambers or if you've never read my, his utmost for, my utmost for his highest, then please do. But he says... That what about what follow, following Yeshua is. He says that it is where our individual desire dies and sanctified surrender lives. I'll say that again. Where our individual desire dies and where sanctified surrender lives. <coughs> Yeshua, what, what he tends to do is he takes the yes of our minds and our wills, and then he begins to reveal just how strong the no is in our hearts. Yes, Lord. Oh, no. Yes, Lord. I'm not doing that. Yes, Lord, I'll follow you everywhere, but I'm not going there. <laughs> and for those simple fishermen as it has been for us, we've embarked on the trip of a lifetime, in my opinion. I feel as though this last 30 odd years has been just the most exciting time, but it's been hard. And I know that you would, you would agree with me on that. I often wonder what it must have been like for those, those fishermen, you know, hoiked out of, in, uh, uh, out of obscurity. I mean, who were they? They were fishermen. They went out on their boat by themselves. You know, they were just nobodies. They fished for fish. They came back. They sold it. You know, apart from the local people who bought the fish, they, they weren't known by anybody. And then suddenly... The spotlight's on them because they're with Yeshua. A man who drew thousands when he preached. And a lot of them were given jobs to do, weren't they? I, I like to think of them, you know, no, you stay like Mark. You stay back, you stay back, okay? No, 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 don't crowd him, don't crowd him. It's me. I'm with Yeshua. See me badge? Yeah. I'm responsible for Yeshua. For his safety. <laughs> they were identified as his disciples. They shared meals with the one who stood up against the authorities and gave it them good style. Didn't he? Hey, Peter, did you hear Yeshua call those Pharisees hypocrites? It's great, wasn't it? <laughs> Even, hey, John, when the chief priest asked Yeshua whose authority he has, yeah, yeah, remember it? Did you see their faces? Did you see them? They just couldn't cope with him, refusing to answer them, could he? They loved it. I'm sure they loved it. I know I would have. Wouldn't you? 
We would have loved it, wouldn't we? <laughs> Even John describes himself as the disciple that Yeshua loved. Have you ever thought about that? Oh, I'm writing this gospel. I'll just put the disciple that Yeshua loved. I won't name myself. I won't actually put my name in there, but everybody will read between the lines and they'll know it's me. <laughs> Oh, how human. How we love identification, position, recognition, authority to direct, authority given by God himself. Oh, my goodness. And I think those three years traveling with him throughout the land, a journey of excitement, a journey of revelation, a journey of learning, of fellowship, education, my goodness. You know... I knew when I got those words, come, follow me, that I needed God. I knew that I needed him. I, I knew that I was pretty bankrupt inside. And so for me, it was very easy, well, relatively easy to make that, that change. It wasn't an immediate thing, but it did, it, it, over the course of about um, a month, I came to that place where I said yes. But you know, I, I actually thought I was invincible. Can you believe that? <laughs> when I got saved, I knew I could move mountains. No, 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 I didn't just think. I knew it. I knew it, yes. I prayed for everything from a deaf ear to a sick budgie. I did. I prayed for my canary at the time, and it got healed. Hallelujah. Nothing was too big or small for my faith. They say that um, new Christians are the most bubbly and most nauseating of the lot. I was the nauseating one. <clears throat> and I ate the word like uh, someone who was starving. I went to every meeting. I just threw myself in up to my hair follicles and loved it. It was great. The, disu the, di the disciples? <laughs> I was writing this. I was just checking it over this morning, and I changed one of those typos. Instead of come, follow me, it was cone, flulo me. <laughs> I think I like that better, actually. <clears throat> so the disciples came. And <laughs> They said, Yeshua, we need a change of clothes. And his answer was, you of little faith. They're with him in the boat. And a storm whips up. And they cry out to Yeshua, save us, save us, we're going to get drowned. And he said, you of little faith. Peter stepped onto the water. In response to the call of God, the call of Yeshua to come, he's seized by a panic. Yeshua's response, you have little faith. And after a while, I began to realize that not all believers, not all people who said they were Christian were the same as me. Did you find that? You know, I just thought that every person who said they were a Christian would just have this amazing revelation of the glory and the light and the color and the distinction and the clarity and the <gasps> excitement that, that I had, but it wasn't so. People began to question my beliefs. Other believers questioned my beliefs. And they would dismiss me and they would say, no, I'm sorry, dear, you're wrong. And because I was only young and because I didn't have what I've got now, a lot of bottle, I, I used to believe them when they said, no, you need to look at that again. That's not what that means. Quashed. Your disciples couldn't get rid of my son's epilepsy. Yeshua's answer you unbelieving and perverse generation. And he's speaking to the disciples. How long shall I stay with you? 
How long shall I put up with you? Matthew 17, 17. How did they feel? Peter said, explain the parable to us. Yeshua's answer, are you still so dull? Matthew 15, 15. How did that fig tree wither so quickly? If you have faith and do not doubt, it will be done. So then comes the trial, doesn't it, in our lives? After the honeymoon. <laughs> times of darkness. Times of suffering. Times of hardship. Certainly happened in my life, the valley of the shadow of death. And the temptation to give it all up must have been wrong. I must, I must have somehow got that wrong. I must have, because it wouldn't be so hard otherwise. It wouldn't be so difficult. And uh, you're faced with the choice. Am I going to follow him or am I going to give it up? Am I going to take the easy way? Because it's actually all or nothing, isn't it? And you weigh it up all, although it feels like nothing, or nothing, and it really is nothing. On hearing this teaching, many of his disciples said, this is a hard teaching. Who can accept it? From this time, many of his disciples turned back and no longer followed him. Then Yeshua said to the twelve, Do you also want to go away? John 6, 66. Isn't that interesting? Man turns away from God. And the reference is 666. The word, the number for man. Interesting. Our friend Peter he denied it, saying, I neither know nor understand what you're saying. I do not know him. Mark 14, 68. And Yeshua, who said, you will be betrayed even by parents, brothers, and sisters, relatives, and friends. And they will put some of you to death. Luke 21, 16. So we can conclude that following Yeshua is not a call to continually live in victory. On the mountaintop, and to experience only blessing and sweetness and light. That's not what it is. I remember switching on the television in the days when I thought God TV and Revelation TV and all these different things were a good idea, and hearing a pastor preach, come to Jesus and everything will be all right. Everything, all your problems, what he said was all your problems will disappear. And not so. God doesn't, he's not, he doesn't just wave a magic wand and take all our problems away. What he wants us to do is to find him in them and hang on to his coattails to lead us out of them and up. It's not, I think we've somehow got such a wrong idea. More importantly, following Yeshua is all about surrender and letting go. And being stripped down. When I was growing up, um, it was in the days when you never got rid of a car, but you serviced it, you put oil and water in it, you decoked it, whatever that meant, and you stripped it down. And my father would take the engine, and I know that your family did, Michael, Take the engine of a car and they'd 
meticulously undo it and put it, lay it all out, clean it all up, and then put it all back together. I mean, what's the point of that? <laughs> But that's something that God does with us. And if you hadn't realized that when you said, yes, I'll follow you, then you're in for a rude awakening <laughs> because it's not very pleasant. It can be so hard to be stripped down, pulled, feeling as though you've lost the plot somehow. <laughs> but what it does is it brings us to a place of identifying with him in his suffering. Paul understood this, didn't he? He says in Philippians 3 verse 10, I want to know Messiah. Yes, to know the power of his resurrection, which we all think is what it's about. Yes, the power, the power, the power. The power of God, yes, the, the, the gifts, the gifts, the gifts, everything. But actually, that's just part of it. To know the power of his resurrection and participation or sharing in his sufferings. Becoming like him in his death. My goodness, that's a sermon in itself. Romans 8, 17 says, Now if we are children... Then we are heirs, heirs of God and co-heirs with Messiah. If indeed we share in his sufferings, in order that we may also share in his glory. So what he's saying is, as his children, as those who are following him, seeking to be his disciple, then yes, we have the heritage of God available to us. We have the everything that is available through Messiah, through Yeshua HaMashiach, is available to us if we share his suffering. In order that we share in his glory. So we get it round the wrong way, don't we? And I want to just say categorically that every lesson we learn, every disappointment that we overcome, Every trial we come through because of Yeshua in us is for a reason. And that reason is to become more conformed to his likeness. More identified with him. Less of me and more of you, Lord. But what gets in the way of this is that no in our hearts that I spoke of earlier. We often allow our personality or our temperament, our natural desires to be a barrier, a hidden, secret, an often unknown barrier to following him. Or, as I did, we dive in up to our nose and we expect God to be grateful because what a catch he's got. <laughs> you know that one? <laughs> he must have been so pleased to get us on his side. <laughs> I, I share that without any pride, I can tell you. I'm shocked that I actually thought that. <laughs> yes, all right, you can have me. <laughs> And, you know, I, I, I think this is often the way we think. We think to ourselves, as I did, that we can then dedicate our gifts to God. God, I'll give you this gift that I've got. It's, I'll give it to you. I'll dedicate it to you, to your service. And then he will glorify those gifts in us, you know. Where do good gifts come from? Do you usually give something that somebody's given you back to them? No. It doesn't work, does it? Except in Michael's mother's case. We used to give her a present. We'd buy her something really nice. We'd agonize. What should we buy her? And we'd give her this present, and she'd look after it for a year, and then she'd give it back. <laughs> Oh, 
do. <laughs> so we, we, they, these gifts that God's given us, that we have, that we operate in, they're his already. We can't give them back to him. We can't, in our pride, dedicate them to him because they already belong to him. Nothing that is good has not come from God. The only thing that we have intrinsically that God would have from us is our right to ourselves. Our right to ourselves. I said earlier, Peter said to Yeshua, we've left all we had to follow you. But actually, all they had was not actually all they had. Peter was speaking of the physical things of life, of the wives and the children and the job and the income and the home comforts. physical things, but Yeshua is far more interested in our souls. Did you know that? He's really not interested in, in the physical side of our lives. He says, don't worry about those things. Don't labor for over those things. You know, look at the flowers, all those things, you know, you know, the scriptures. Don't worry about those things. I'll sort those things out for you. But... How's your soul today? How's your attitudes? How, how are you speaking to others? How are you behaving with others? How's the love in your heart today? Have you, have you actually done, said, or thought something loving towards another person today? That's what he does, isn't it? And that's what goes, <laughs> makes us go, ooh. <laughs> Remember Oswald said, where our individual desire dies and sanctified surrender lives. So for those three years, for those disciples walking alongside Yeshua, they were not just so that we would have gospel accounts to record and um, have examples as how he did ministry, how he spoke, how he healed people, how we should teach from them. Yeshua needed to take each one of those disciples and make them ready. They followed him so that they would be ready for when he went, when he left them. He fashioned them, he honed them, he filed them down, he chipped them off. He scraped them. Painful things, painful processes. He let them make mistakes, didn't he? And then he showed them the right answers. Because he needed them to grow up. We all need to grow up in maturity. to understand who he was, his authority, his divine purpose, to bring conviction enough to say, you are God the Messiah. You are the Son of God. He needed their words to reveal the state of their hearts. And have you ever heard words coming out of your mouth that have made you go, oh, I wish I hadn't said that. Oh, why did I do that? I let him down. I've let myself down. And I've let God down. Out of the heart, the mouth speaks. So when we hear things coming out of our mouths that we don't want to hear said, it's a heart issue. It's not their fault. It's not the person whom you said the words to. It's yours truly. He wanted them to understand what they were capable of when they were squeezed beyond their capacity to bear it. And sometimes we have to get there. It's where God allows us to go 
beyond what we think we can bear. And even at the end, the doubt, the unbelief, the betrayal and the turning away, the faithlessness and the fear that beset every one of those disciples. And they will beset you and me, more than likely. But God. At the end, it's always about him, isn't it? Even in the midst of all that stuff. Because God knew exactly what each one of the disciples' circumstances were, what they would be, and how he would work in and through them. And that is exactly true for you and me. He knows what our individual circumstances are. In fact, he engineers them to be just what they are. In order that he can work in and through every single one of them. And the wonderful thing is that for every one of us, for believers everywhere, he has given us a source. He's given us a well, remember? A well filled and overflowing, bubbling up with living water. A source of continual new life. Perpetually fresh through the Holy Spirit which flows out of us through each circumstance, if we will let him. Which allows us to, which enables us to allow God to have his way in and through us. Because honestly, if we don't have the Holy Spirit, then we're pretty useless. <sighs> you know, we fall into religion we fall into rules and into legalism. We fall into lovelessness because without the Holy Spirit in our hearts, really, we're bankrupt. And if our will is not fully surrendered to him, if there are those individual desires still alive and kicking, then we, we just don't find it possible to enter into sanctified surrender. Sometimes it's so difficult when there's a call to surrender within the worship or within the prayer time that it's hard for some to grab hold of that word surrender and enter into it. When I was... Um, saved, I came to, to the Lord having trained all my life to be an opera singer, all my life. From the age of five years old when I sang a first, my first solo, that was what I was going to be. I was going to be a, an opera singer. And uh, I was 28 when I got saved. And uh, I'd given up on singing in one way and another for the previous five years, but that's another story. Um, and when I started to sing in the worship s setting, I discovered all that life came back to me. All that performance, all that desire to be noticed, <laughs> all that agony of what do they think? What are they thinking? Oh, they can hear me. Oh, no. Oh, but I mustn't think. Oh, it was dreadful. It was terrible. And I wanted, I managed to deal with that. It took me about six, eight months of, of really putting flesh to death. And I, 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 I got, got that sorted in the end to the point where now I couldn't care less. I really, really could not care less what anybody thinks. But I wanted to become a singer-songwriter. I wanted to write songs. God was giving me songs. I wanted to be a songwriter. But you know, God didn't want that. And I kicked against the goads, and I did everything in my power for five years to make it work, to be a songwriter, to get my songs out, to record them, to, you know, do everything that I wanted to do. And God never let me. Until the point where I realized that I had to let go of that, what was an unsanctified desire. It was a desire that was of my heart and not of God's. 
It was not what God wanted for my life. It was what I wanted. I had to let him put it to death in me and for him to leave it into his hands to do with what he will. And he did. He put it to death. And he never, he never let it come to life again. So, follow me. Yeshua says, follow me today. What do you want to do? What do you want to be in the kingdom? Maybe there's a gift. Maybe there's something that you have that needs to be given up in order to reach that place of surrender. Maybe there's a heart issue that needs to be given up, needs to be dealt with, needs to be recognized in order for God's perfect will to be found deep, deep inside. <coughs> we can all identify with the fear of, and the anxiety of the disciples as they walked along with God, with Yeshua in those days together with the pride and the position, we can recognize ourselves in those men. And yet whatever God did with them, he's going to do with us. So whatever we're going through right now, whether it's desirable or undesirable, whether we feel we've got victory or we're still a long way off, I want to encourage you today that this is part of the cost of following him. It's part of the cost of laying down our lives, words which we say and which we sing so easily, but which actually hurt. The rubber hits the road and we screech in agony. So be encouraged, because he's on our case. He's having his way in our lives. And it's all because he wants us to share in his glory. And if we don't share in his sufferings, then we don't get, we have no right to share in his glory. So be encouraged. Amen.